At the May 1883 meeting, the Carroll County School Board noted a written application for college school in the east end of Westminster was received, considered, placed on file, and action thereupon postponed. The request was repeated in early June of 1887 and again three weeks later. At the latter meeting, the board recorded Charles Street, Colored, David Arlen, and other colored citizens from the east end of Westminster and John Adams and others from the vicinity of Weston Chapel repeated their request for an application of $250 towards a house for a colored school at each place. On motion of Mr. Pugh, the request was unanimously granted. Mr. George M. Crawford became principal in 1931-32. The PTA headed by Mrs. Mamie Dixon and the school staff contacted Dr. L. S. James, the president of Bowie State Normal School. Dr. James located the widow of Dr. Robert R. Moten to give permission for the school to be named after her late husband. In 1932-33, the school formally received the name of Robert Moton School. Robert Moton was born in Virginia on August 26, 1867. He graduated from Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in 1890. Moton and Booker T. Washington became close allies, traveling throughout the South, promoting the need for economic independence and racial progress. When Booker T. Washington died, Moton became the second president of Tuskegee Normal School. Moton served as an advisor to Presidents Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, and Franklin D. Roosevelt. In 1948, a new building was provided at the intersection of Charles Street and South Center Street. The history of the Robert Moton School is rich with a community of people who demonstrated strength when weakness would be expected. Perseverance when times were difficult, commitment in the face of defeat, and faith in the God-given rights of equality and justice for all people. Their stories must be told, preserved, and shared. We said a pledge, and um, everyone had to take his or her turn in reading um, scripture. And we said the Lord's Prayer. Very good. Okay. And started our classes. Yes. We had devotion every morning. We got all of their books that were torn, pages gone out of them, and the teachers had to sort of make up what they thought might have been on the pages that wasn't there. And a lot of the pages, they were scratched through some of the words were scratched out. Um, they were just poor, very poor. Uh, the teachers that we had made sure that we got the best education that there was to get. Even though we had inferior books, mm -hmm. uh, equipments and those kinds of things, but they made sure uh, we knew what we had to know. It was a, it was, it was really, high on the list of most most parents mm -hmm. because they realized that as a as an African American or young black child at that time if you didn't have an education you weren't going to go very far you weren't going to achieve very much in life so education for most parents was a was a was a high priority and I know my parents uh, they were they really had a thing about all their children getting an education and my mother used to preach that to us all the time if you don't get an education your, your life is going to be very deficient in a lot of areas, so you need to get an education. And people really were um, eager for everybody to get an education, um, at least high school. Um, 
there were seven in my family, so all seven graduates from high school from Moton. Mm -hmm. Then there was one family where it was 12 and they all graduated, so. And I think it was a struggle probably at that time to, to put kids through high school because um, you had a lot of, uh, like, interference, I guess you'll call it, from those who represented the Board of Education of getting young men pulled out of school to work on their farms. But uh, most of the parents rejected that idea. The parents actually paid, paid for, bought the bus. Uh, they used to have fundraisers and all kinds of things to, to raise the money to buy these buses. And that's one of the reasons why they had a lot of problems with some of the maintenance of them, because they had to come up with the money to maintain them as well. Mm. Uh, so I remember early when I was a young student, Howard Davis used to be our bus driver. He used to live right next to us, two doors down from me. Mm. Um, and he actually, between the parents of Union Bridge and him, he had a little bit of money. He came up with, with the rest of the money to get the bus on the road, and then the parents paid him back for the money he put in the bus. And he was the bus driver as well. Uh, but that's how their parents, that's what the parents had to do back then to get their children an education. Uh, because the county didn't provide them anything. Because we were from the southern part of the county and we had to come all the way to Westminster. Um, and then we had to go over to Ricestown to pick up some children. Mm. And I mean, we just had a long route to travel, uh, particularly during the uh, bad weather. Uh, by the time we got to school, schools had been closed for maybe an hour or so. So we just turned around and come on back home. It started on our side, the Union Bridge, then it picked us all up, and then it went into Union Bridge, and on the other side of Union Bridge, out to Uniontown, and then back to Uniontown, back to New Windsor, and then from New Windsor out to Marston, and back from Marston where he picked up your uncle, and, and then back into Westminster and picked up some kids in Westminster, just outside of Westminster. Mm -hmm. So I picked them up from all of that part of the county and brought them in here. So that's probably about 30 of us on the, on the bus. I remember one situation where we had one year, a couple of years, we had a, a kerosene heater on the bus, mm -hmm. uh, which the bus driver had sitting right next to him, but it didn't have any heat on the bus, so it got kind of cold, picking the winter time. Um, and he, he assigned a couple of, couple of the elderly boys, seniors, seniors, to sit there and watch, hold it to keep it from tipping over <laughs> as we were driving down the road. By the I guess by the time I was get, I got to be about the eighth and ninth grade, the county started providing buses for them. Rarely did it um, close the snow. I can recall one, well, near the end, a man named Galladay had a whole fleet of buses, and he used to drive us up here. But it snowed so much, he had his son stand in the door of the bus watching the snow bank so he wouldn't hit it. Who, one who stands out and who is now my friend is uh, Sidney Shepard. Mm -hmm. Sidney Shepard uh, was a physical education teacher. I think he saw, and I don't remember what, but he thought, thought he taught a couple of other classes and he taught things like drama. I remember he taught us to dance. Uh, he taught me how to box. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a, an all-around uh, educator. Named Vivian Crampton. Beautiful little Indian-like woman. And I fell in love with her, you know. <laughs> and she was a music director, you know, showed us how to dance. And I really, I, she should have sent me home or something, but I'm going to take so many points off your, off your report card and this and that, and I would do crazy things. I can't tell you what I've done, but <laughs> it, you know, I was I was a little devilish when I went to school. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Shockley, she was a little tiny woman, very very um, um, into her teaching. Uh, you know, she would, you know, we had fun, but she was determined that we were going to be educated. 
So, you know, she was uh, stern. And the one thing I remember about her, the green pointer that she used to have, you got your fingers cracked if you were doing some things wrong, like talking or, or not paying attention in class. My favorite teacher was my first grade teacher. Her name was Beatrice Shockley. And I thought, when I was in the first grade, I thought, oh, she was, you know, tall statured. But I found out by the time I got that she was a shorty. She was like maybe five foot, that was it. But she was such a teaching giant that it impacts my mind today of the things that she taught and the things that she did in that classroom in a multi-graded room, first through th three. Uh, Mr. Kane, because he was our music teacher, then next would have been uh, our gym teacher. And then I, I liked uh, Mr. Beard. Mr. Beard was our chemistry teacher, and, and he, he was nice. Uh, Mr. Chase, he was a gym teacher. He doubled as a history teacher. Uh, Mr. Kane, he was a music teacher. He doubled as math teacher. So, I mean, they, they did multiple duties. In elementary school, it was Miss Shockley because she made you learn. If she thought you didn't understand what she was talking about, she would ask you to stay at recess or when it was time to go home. And then she said, well, you act like you didn't understand it or you weren't paying attention. Now tell me what I, was I talking about? Miss May Prince, and May Prince was uh, in charge of home economics. But uh, like uh, Mr. Gates and, and all the other teachers, these teachers had dual roles. Uh, there was um, Mr. Alonzo Lee was one of the first teachers I had when I went to Robert Moulton. And uh, Mr. Lee also taught different classes, but he was also a bus driver. And according to history, I think he and some of the other teachers even helped to purchase and helped to use their money to operate those buses. Mm -hmm. But he was a, a, a driver as well mm -hmm. when I started to ride with Moton. And uh, I mean, Mr. Bennett taught music and, and, and drama. Ms. Caldwell, she taught uh, biology. I remember Ms. Caldwell because he, well, all the young boys remember Ms. Caldwell because she was good looking. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, I think pretty much every boy in the class was willing to take biology. <laughs> Annie Evans was my teacher, I think I was about the fourth, fifth grade. And I went home and told my mother, Annie Evans, I thought, oh, my teacher just doesn't like me. Because she just, she, my mother looks at me and she says, boy, <laughs> isn't Annie Evans your teacher? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, I've known Ann and Evans. Matter of fact, we were the best friends through high school. I, know, I have known her since we were little kids. She is not going to mystery. Don't try to give me this. <laughs> Couldn't get away with anything. Miss Prince, she was just like a little old angel. Uh, you've heard of Miss Prince. Uh, we had a, a teacher named Codwell. I forget what her first name was, Miss Codwell. But anyhow, I didn't do it intentionally. I happened to bump her one day, and boy, <laughs> I thought she was going to kill me. <laughs> Lewis Beard taught chemistry, and I love chemistry. Science, uh, math, um, Lewis King, uh, I, I, those are my two favorite subjects. And when I first got to Robin Moulton, the one thing that stands out, we were in Mr. Lee's class. And he was screaming, he was, having, he was having one of those bad days. And because at the time I didn't understand, but now I do. He was having a bad day. He was hooping and howling and screaming. And every time you ask him a question, he just snapped your head off. And I went to ask something. And he, uh, oh, he lit into me. Whew. And uh, when he finally shut up, I whispered under my breath and I, I cursed him. Well, Miss Prince, the princess of the class, Mary Chase, was sitting in front of me where she told on me. 
Lord, back there he come. He went upside my head with that big old hand, and I could feel, I could hear the bells ringing. But my favorite teacher I never was was Mr. Stanley. Miss Stanley was a, a lot of a lot of them didn't like her, but she she kind of stood out uh, for me personally uh, because she. She used to tell me all the time, I, I remember your parents. I know your parents real well. And I, I taught your two older brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know if I go tell your mother, I know you're going to get a lot of trouble. Uh, I remember, remember Mr. Neal. Mr. Neal was never one of my favorites. He just passed away here about three, four years ago. Mm -hmm. He always used to come back to see, said, I remember you when you were a little boy. And I, I had you in my class. You were a little old troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> But he's a great, he was a real great guy. We became great friends later on. Uh, my buddy Talkie Cooper, we would be in the shop class downstairs, Mr. Stevens' toy shop, and uh, we'd wanted something from Charlie Coins' store. So we would sneak Talkie Cooper in the basement windows at the Robin, new Robin Moulton Moore ground level. So we would sneak Talkie Cooper out of the window, and he'd shoot down over the hill and down across Charles Street and over the Charlie Coins and get a big, candy and stuff and bring it back and we'd keep Mr. Stevens occupied and then we'd sneak him back in <laughs> Daisy Harris was the meanest teacher in the school. Mm -hmm. She drove her from Baltimore every day. Mm -hmm. And she was, she didn't play. Um, as a matter of fact, your uncle and I were in the hallway and she grabbed us and drug us in the library. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to be out here this time of day. <laughs> no one bothered Miss Harris. Strict, but yet, um, uh, you didn't go in her class and come out not knowing something. Mm. She was determined that she was going to learn Shakespeare and those kinds of things. Daisy Harris, she didn't play. No foolishness. When you went in her room, you went to learn. Daisy Harris. She was just such a, um, a nice instructor and a nice disciplinarian and all the things that you look for, you know, in a strong teacher. Daisy Harris was stern. Whoo! <laughs> and uh, but, uh, but she was a fair person. And she was an extremely intelligent woman. She was a fantastic English teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't particularly care for her at the time, but she was a fantastic woman, fantastic teacher. Mm -hmm. Later on, I really appreciated the, the, how she used to handle the children and how she, used to, how she taught English. All the students came out of Rod Moton had, a, could, had an excellent tutoring and education in English. I remember going to college and having one of my college professors says, I have got to meet that English teacher up there, Rob Moton, up there in Carroll County. I've heard so much about it. all the students coming out of, mm -hmm. out of Carroll County. They all passed English with flying colors. Mm -hmm. But she was hard-nosed. She was a tough, <laughs> tough old lady. <laughs> but uh, after I graduated, I, I, I come to respect her a lot more. And, and, I, and as a matter of fact, we, when she died, we went to a funeral in Baltimore. I, I, I admired uh, Doc Crawford. He was a uh, uh, fourth, right, uh, sturdy man. Mm -hmm. uh, when he walked, he walked with authority. When he spoke, he spoke with authority. And he was one to be respected. And I respected, I admired uh, Doc Crawford. He was very stern, serious about the black children learning. He said, if you don't learn but one thing a day, you have learned it for life. I got kept to school in seventh grade because I knew the word osmosis. Dr. Crawford taught science, right? Mm -hmm. And the clerk on the test was the word osmosis. I don't know what osmosis is, you know. I stayed up to school telling them what osmosis was. That's how it was. They made sure you lose something. And I'll never forget that word taught me, you know, a liquid going through a Membrane to a thick, thick. Oh, he went through the whole walk. I know now they osmosis because Dr. Crawford, seventh grade, came up to school.
Mr. Beard, uh, of course, I, you know, I'd known him for years, yeah, up until his death. Uh, he was a rather gentle person, mm -hmm. uh, very encouraging. Mr. Beard was, I guess, one of my favorite teachers. Um, he became my principal the last year that I was at Moton. Before that was Mr. Gates. And uh, him and I became good friends when he became principal. Also, he was my homeroom teacher. She was tough as a teacher, so I know she was tough as a principal, but she just, she was dead serious. You didn't play in her class. You try it, I did. She took care of that real quick, so. I'll tell you a story. The principal at that time was um, Francis Gates. And Mr. Gates must have thought I was his son, because I'd go to school and he'd give me his car keys. If something had to be delivered somewhere in the county, I drove his car. Well, one day a young lady got sick and she had to go home. And Gates said, take her home. And on the way down 32, going to Wood Sykesville, I wrecked his car. I'll never forget that. The road was wet, and I lost control of it. Side swiped right into a telephone pole. Mm. I didn't get hurt. The girl didn't get hurt. The police came, called the school. Mr. Gates came down in somebody's car, took me down to his house. Well, first, and he called my father. My father came up, too. Took me down to his house, gave me the keys to his other car, and had me drive that back to school for him. My father was afraid that Gates was going to sue us <laughs> for wrecking his car, but he didn't. He never did. He never said another word about it. So when I finished high school, I had said, I'm going to go into the service. And Gates at the time said, oh, no, you're not. You're going to college. Mm -hmm. And of the 28 students in that class, at least 10 went to college. He used to take, he used to get personally involved in all of his students' lives. I mean, I mean, personally involved in terms of the rumor mill and, and and because he he was interested in who you were dating and who was dating who and <laughs> so it, we had, we used to have a lot of problems with him that way. But other than that, he was a great principal. We was calling ourselves trying to play a little hooky, mm -hmm. and he caught us. So he used that paddle that my brother was talking about with the holes in it. They were like father figures. They really were. They were strong supporters. Um, only thing they had against, I guess, everything, we had to travel so far for anything. You couldn't, you didn't play in the county league. Mr. Shepard was, uh, I'll tell you, he was stern in his field, you know. I mean, he, he wanted to get perfection out of you. And uh, he, was, he wasn't no hard fellow to get along with, but he just didn't want to play. You know, no foolishness. Mm -hmm. Let's get to business. <laughs> and that's the type of chap he was. When I came, you know, college school, you had to teach more than one thing to begin with. When I came here to Robert Moton at that time, I had a class in uh, ninth grade math. I also had a class in oral history and also United you know, States history. So we taught at least two or three classes besides phys ed. I had less phys ed <laughs> than I had other classes. See, Robert Moton was, was a small school. I don't know what the enrollment of the high school alone was, but I doubt if it was 70 students in the high school. Well, in order to teach, each teacher had to teach several subjects. Uh, for example, I taught eighth grade science. I, my assignment when I came was to teach boys physical education, eighth grade core, and eighth grade science. Uh, when I went to high school, Daisy Harris taught me, she was not only the, she taught English, she taught music, she taught art, 
and she taught French. Uh, so one teacher had to teach many subjects. The best part was you got to know the kids uh, throughout the school, the, the whole kids, rather than just gym classes. I knew him in a history class, you know, and, and other subjects. So that was good to know. You, the kids knew us and we knew the kids individually. And that was uh, very important. We got to know the kids and the kids got to know us. By and large, most of the students were very good students. Not only that, I not only knew them, I knew the parents. Some I knew the grandparents because I'd gone to school with their parents or older brothers and sisters. So uh, they couldn't act up in my class because they knew I knew who to tell. <laughs> the most enjoyable thing, I think, was, was coaching basketball. Uh, at that time, in most of the schools, Maryland, uh, black schools especially, the most important interscholastic sport was basketball. Unfortunately, basketball was very demanding. Uh, first place, athletics had to pay for itself. The nearest, uh, we were segregated. So the nearest black school to me, I guess, was Banneker High School in Catonsville or Carver High School in Towson, Lincoln High School in Frederick, uh, Central, I mean, uh, Habit Grace Consolidated High School in Habit Grace, Bel Air High School in Bel Air. These were the schools on my schedule. Uh, since the program had to pay for itself, I had to make enough money to, number one, buy a uniform for my players. Number two, I had to pay enough money, make enough money to pay up for a bus to carry them to Banneker or to Bel Air or to North Street High School in Hagerstown. Uh, I had to make enough money to pay the officials to rep, uh, officiate the games. And, and to do that, you had to charge admission. Uh, to make a couple of extra pennies, we sold hot dogs and sodas. So I had to somebody to operate the concession stand. Then we formed an athletic association, uh, I think for, ten, for 50 cents became a member of the Athletic Association. That entitled you to come to Robert Moton High School Thursday for recreation night. You know, we could play table tennis. Again, we sold hot dogs and sodas. It had a record player so you could dance to make a little extra money. And as a member of the Athletic Association, you got into the games for half price. Uh, so making money to, to operate was, 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 was the biggest problem, but I still had to pay normally for the bus. So if we were carrying girls and boys, say 24 or 25 players and, and the two coaches, so that meant I had 25 or the 40 passenger bus, I might have 15 or 20 seats to sell. So. My job was to fill up that bus, to help to pay for the bus. So sometimes I'd put five boys in my car and follow the bus to the game and sell those extra five seats to, to pay for the bus. And our fall sport, uh, in the scholastic sport, was cross country. So I used, in order to get cross country to run two miles, in order to get guys to go out from, to, for cross country, I told them I was going to pick my basketball team from my cross country team. Well, that did two things. It made my made sure that my basketball team was in condition when the season started, but it got me competitors in in the cross country. We had a pretty good basketball team, um, 58-59. Oh, we had Thomas Magruder, Richard Hill, David Woodyard, Joseph Shepard, myself. Herbert Brooks, mm -hmm. Charles Davis, I think that was. And, uh, you know, we, we were good. We were always outnumbered fan-wise, and all the other teams had more players than we did. Mm -hmm. But it was just the fact that Stan Chase made sure that you were as prepared as you could be when you got there. We had gotten to the point that whites didn't intimidate us.
Uh, you go to a school, the worst place we ever, I think we played was Mount Airy. They just didn't like us down there. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, we weren't, we knew that if we went there and acted stupid, he'd throw us off the team. We also had track. Uh, we didn't have any facilities for track. In fact, this school was built, when they built the school, they cut the top of a hill off and to make it level. So in order to get 100 yards straight away, the last five yards, for instance, Stan was uphill <laughs> for track. I couldn't get a four, two, uh, 420 track oval. I had a 220 oval uh, for track. Our God, for you know, like Gary Hudson and Bill Hudson Woods and Sykes earlier and the, the uh, Collins boys. In fact, they're on there too. Chesky Corsi, those guys run like the wind. Oh, this is our 1956 girls basketball team. Uh, we had a lot of fun. Not that we won a whole lot, but we won our share. Uh, Joan Sims, who was our manager, and Dolores Smack, this is the back row. Jeannie Magruder, Rosalie Cooper, uh, Dolores Morrison, who we call Fizz, and our coach was Marlene Preston, the front row, Anna Woodyard, Joan Lee Sims, uh, Jane Milbury, Mary Charms, Francis Thomas, and Dorothy Jason. That was our 1956 girls basketball team. Yeah, you couldn't run back and forth like they do now. So on one side would be the opposite teams forward. They were the shooters and my team's guard. All we did was guard, we couldn't shoot. You could only dribble the ball two times. So <laughs> we didn't do a lot of moving. <laughs> But that, that's how we played. We did not run up and down the court like the boys ran up and down the court, but the girls only could play half court. When I came here, the attitude among the boys was that if you did not live in Westminster, you couldn't play sports. Uh, and the reason they thought they had that because you couldn't get here. So I told them, if you can get here, I will see that you get home. So after practice at 9 o'clock, I might put four or five boys in my car and take them to Union Bridge. Your father would wait here for me. Then I'd come back and pick him up and chubby and, 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 and carry them down toward Rice's town. And he got off where they went off, off the river. On game night, the same thing would happen. I said, if you can get here, I see that you will get home. For example, if we were playing Central Consolidated in, 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 in Bel Air, the first game started at 7 o'clock. Then they had the girls game and the boys game. It might be 10 o'clock, 10.30 when the game was over. By the time I got back here, it would be 11.30, 12 o'clock. I'd carry some boys to Union Bridge and bring them back. It might be 1 o'clock or 1.30 when I got home. Next morning at 7.30, I had to be on my way back up here again. Uh, it was demanding, but those were the most enjoyable years of my professional career. Okay, now what was your day like? It wasn't that bad. <laughs> that was hectic. At school, we had New Homemakers of America, NHA, and also had Future Farmers of America. And the boys belonged to, to FFA and the girls to um, NHA. And we went, um, it was a project just like homemaking, what you would do in a home. And like, in fact, in school, we, we were taught how to can some food and they had at that time they would have uh, conferences and stuff on the eastern shore at Princess Anne which is now UMES 
and we go there for conferences. Every year, we will go to Washington for the Safety Patrol Parade. And a uh, lot of uh, schools would win trophies and things because you could have your band. We didn't have a band, so it was just, just uh, anyone that was on the Safety Patrols, they could go. And every year we would go and we'd have our little banner saying Robert Moten School. He started the Carroll County chapter in 1953, and um, he'd always traveled to Baltimore to the NAACP meetings. Uh, they always met at that time in the Sharp Street Church in Baltimore, and uh, I'd always ride down with him, and, and sometimes I'd sit in the car, and sometimes I could sit in the back and keep my mouth shut, of course, but yeah, he's got to see a lot of people that ordinarily I wouldn't have got to see. And uh, Martin Luther King visited there one Saturday. He was a guest speaker. Thurgood Marshall, mm -hmm. uh, Lillian Jackson. Of course, she was the sort of, they call her the mother of the NAACP, as you might know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Mitchells. We'd always go and play with the white children in Union Bridge, played sports and all with them, and during the summers and basketball, anything. But uh, going to school was, ooh, that was different. That was a shock to me when I realized I wasn't going back to Robert Moten in the seventh grade. My dad told me three weeks before school opened up, <laughs> yes, that I would be going to Elmer A. Wolf. And I had uh, a friend of mine named Ron Stitley he took us, one day we was playing Sammy Butler and I and Larry and my brother Gerald, we went with them and they, the school was opened up at Elmer Wolf and I told daddy about the school, you know, he never let on at all that mm -hmm. I would be attending that school that September. Everybody was, you know, friendly, it was, you know, and but they went home, I guess, and told the parents that blacks were in the school and I think it, it changed up a little bit. Not. Not a whole lot, but it, it was a difference. It was, it was different. Some of the kids didn't come back to school and things of that nature, but yeah, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but then they all came back and it smoothed out after a while. They had meetings at the Elmer Wolf School about uh, integration and all, but it got worked out and we had a very good principal named Henry J. Kanowitz. He sort of handled things in a, a very professional manner. Mm -hmm. I knew everybody at Robert Moton at that time, and, and, and all my buddies, mm -hmm. you see, were there. And so, and then I come to a, a, a different school and of different color also. It was, it was right much on a, a guy 12 years old at that time, at least that's what I think, anyhow. Mm -hmm. So it was different, and you felt funny, but. But people were pretty, pretty good. Most of my classmates were pretty good. And as we grew in years, well, we, we come much close, more close, I'll say. Mm -hmm. And uh, to now we meet once every two months, mm -hmm. our class does. We have a little gathering, we get together and, and we all have a good time. Whew, rough time it was, 1954, I entered the second grade. And of course, my father, Merton Hammond, being the first president of the NAACP, uh, was, was bent on his children getting a good education with good, in a good school with good books. Not that Robert Moton wasn't a good school, but it was just the crowding and everything. So uh, we were the pilots. It was uh, our family, uh, the Noakes family, the Butler family, the Brown family, and um, Millberry family, which was my uncle's children. So we were the pioneers and we plowed the way and it was very difficult. Um, one, uh, several things that stand out in my mind. Um, when we um, got to school the first day, uh, I was met by a teacher and taken to my class. And of course, when I got to class, I was greeted and the kids were all over me, wanted to be my friend because they didn't really know what I was. And, um, 
and I didn't really say much being scared. I, I was scared to death. And um, my brother Gerald came to pick me up that next day. He took me to class. And just as warm as, as they were that first day, taking my lunchbox, took my sweater to what they called the cloak room, hanging it up. Well, when they saw my brother, immediately they were calling me nigger. And, and they said, you know, they, they dented my lunchbox. And my sweater had footprints over it where they had taken it down and walked on it. So it was awful. And I mean, the first day was so good. And mom said, you got along fine. And I was saying, yeah, I want to go back. The second day I came home in tears. And I told her, I said, I don't want to ever go back there. And she said, but you have to, baby. Because she said, this is the best thing for you. And I mean, it was so much uh, of a burden to my older brother and sister. They, they did not finish school. They, they dropped out because it was the pressure. And you have to remember back then, it wasn't like, you know, uh, elementary, middle, and then high. Mm -hmm. It was one through 12. So you had to deal with those adult children who were grown and who would say the most nasty things to you. Uh, it was very difficult um, to the point where when we got off the bus in the evenings uh, and walked back our road, young men that, was, that were driving to school would bring their cars back and run us in the field and call us pickaninnies, niggers, you name it. Uh, and um, we ended up, Daddy said, well, he didn't want anything to happen to us. And he took us to our, uh, my cousin Helen Noakes home in Union Bridge. We got off the bus there and we'd wait for him to get off. And a lot of times, Daddy worked at Lehigh Cement, and a lot of times he um, didn't get to pick us up until like almost eight o'clock. So for us, it was difficult because we had to go home, eat, uh, you know, do our homework, take a bath, and then, you know, go to bed. So it was, it was rough, it was really rough. I can remember a, an incident in the fifth grade. Um, teacher's name was Mrs. Mitch. I think she was from West Virginia. Husband was a pastor. Because of my nerves, I mean, I was just on edge, you know. I had a few, I had friends, a few friends that were uh, Caucasian, but for the most part, I just felt so alone because I was always the only one in my class. And um, we would do the pledge in the morning, we would do the prayer, a patriotic song, and we would listen to the, you know, the media over the, loudspeaker about what was going to go on that day in school. And I was in class that day and I had on a pair of shoes where my foot would come out of. And I was always like shaking my leg because it was nerves. I knew what it was. I know now what it was. And um, she told me, she said, put your shoe back on. And the kids started snickering and saying, her feet stink, her feet stink. And you know, just nasty little things. And she actually came over, took my shoe, and we were on the second floor. She threw it out the window. And I had to walk down two flights of stairs in tears, embarrassed, and get my shoe and walk back in. And when I got in the classroom, it was just a heyday. So that was another awful day in my life. And I can remember when I got home telling mom, and mom said, when she called daddy, daddy's, um, um, uh, nickname was Jazz. She said, well, when Jazz gets home, we're going to tell him about this. And of course, I explained to Daddy what happened. He said, get in the car. He took me back up to Elmer Wolf School, and I'll never forget the principal at the time was Mr. Gilbert Perrin, a very sweet and gentle, understanding man. And he didn't like foolishness, and he didn't believe in you being different. Everybody was to be treated the same. And when Daddy made me explain to him what happened. He said right away, he said, now, I can't believe he called me his little singer. He said, you being my little singer, because he also taught music, and you wouldn't come and tell me. And I told him I was afraid. He said, never be afraid. And he said to Daddy, he said, Mr. Hammond, it's in your hands as to what you would like for me to do to her. Because he said, that is very, very unacceptable. That's not a teacher's that's not the way a teacher should act. And he said, if you say that she really shouldn't be in this school, he said, I'll get on the phone and call Samuel Jenis, who was the superintendent at that time. And he said, and we'll, we'll, we'll 
make amends and get a substitute until we can cover it. And Daddy, being a, a, a man of the Bible and you know, and a, a, and a father and a family man, said no. He said, but I expect her to do an open apology to my daughter. He said that was very rude and very nasty. And the next morning, uh, when we got in the classroom, after all the exercises that we always went through were done, uh, she made the class settle down and she said that she uh, did something that a teacher should never do. And she explained to them that what she did to me was wrong and that she, she publicly apologized to me and came over and hugged me. And I don't know how she felt about doing it, but she did. And what's so funny is um, she and her husband stayed in this area uh, after I was out of school and I would run into her on occasions in Westminster and do you know that lady would always come up and hug me and ask me how things were going and telling me how she's how you know she was proud of who I became and whatnot so it was almost like what happened made her respect me just a bit more everybody says to me I, I can't believe you're not bitter and this was my answer, and it was then, and it will always be that way. My parents raised me to respect people, no matter what. And my, my daddy and mommy always said, don't ever let anybody see that they've got more manners than you. Mm -hmm. So what I, you know, in, 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 entailed during those years was like a growing experience for me because it made me a better person. I always gave this same adage to my boys that dad always told me. He says, in this world, you can get anything you want if you have an education and you work hard. Um, 1954, I guess. I was only about 11 years old at the time. Uh, because I don't want to take up too much time with this, but my, my, my mother refused to let us go when they first integrated the schools. Uh, I think they integrated them the very next year after the law was passed. And uh, it started right there in Union Bridge. Union Bridge uh, at Elmer Wharf High School and, and of course at New Windsor High School. They were the first two schools to integrate in, the, in this county. Of course, we lived in Union Bridge and they had a big meeting with the NAACP and everything. It, 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 they came into the county trying to, and discussing this and trying to, you know, to, to facilitate this whole integration. Mm -hmm. And my mother just said, I am not sending my, young, my two youngest children up there. I said, my two older boys, they old enough, they can deal with it. But uh, of course, I was one of the, my sisters, I was two youngest. She said, I don't think my younger children are ready for this. this. And I'm not sending them. So we didn't go. Uh, a lot of them did. A lot of kids went. I know still have friends like Pernell Hammond, Hammond. Mm -hmm. He's called Jazz Hammond. He, he, all his family went. The Butler family went to New Windsor. Okay, but we didn't go. None of my brothers and sisters, we didn't go initially. It wasn't until, until they opened Francis Scott Key, which was in 1958, 59, 59, I guess it was, that we went. Of course, my two older brothers had already graduated by that time, and my sister and I were still left. Um, and my mother, by that time, my mother had passed away. And, uh, and I remember my father came to me and he said, son, you're, you look like you're old enough now. I think you're old enough. You can handle a lot of these problems you're going to face. So, but I'm going to let the decision up to you. You're, you're, you're older than your sister. <laughs> uh, I don't want your sister to go up there by herself. But, so if you want to go, and you're going to be a senior. Yeah. And he said, but if you don't want to go, I'll, I'll let you stay at Robert Merton. But I'll, you make the decision. You're old enough to make your own decisions now. At that time, I thought we were deficient in, in our education we were getting around Mountain because I could see I could see the differences in the mm -hmm. schools even then. Uh, but I and I knew I was going off to college and I wanted to I wanted to get the best education I could. So I reluctantly, really it was a reluctant decision. I finally made the decision that I was gonna go up there for my senior year. Because I wanted I wanted to I wanted to be able to, to get into any college that I was trying to get into. Mm -hmm. It started where all my friends, all of a sudden, when they found out that I had transferred, my father had signed my sister and I up to go to, uh, they all started giving me a hard time. They, oh, I, we were the, I don't know what happened, like the whole world just descended on us. 
Uh, no, all my, they wouldn't even talk to me. They'd give me a hard time about all kinds of things. I felt like they just ostracized us. Mm. Uh, so I had said, well, I think I, think I made a mistake here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna change my mind. I, so I really looked into it and they said, yeah, you can change your mind if you don't wanna go. So I was about to change my mind. Mm. So one day I got summoned to the principal's office. Now I'm still at Rob Moton now. And of course, immediately I thought I'd, like I'll use, I'd got in trouble again. And I said, my father's gonna kill me. <laughs> you don't want me to get in trouble again at this age. And I walk in the principal's office and there's the principal and, and the superintendent of schools. Well, I knew who he was, because he used to come over there quite frequently. But I'd never, never got close to him. Mm -hmm. And I walk in and I sit down. The principal tells me to sit down. And I'm saying, what the heck am I in here for? And then he walks out, leaves me with the superintendent. I'm wondering what the world's going on. Mm -hmm. Sitting there and he starts telling me, I think you need to change your mind. And I was about to say to him, I already changed my mind, but mm -hmm. he, he didn't give me a chance. He just kept talking, so I was just sitting there when listening to him. And then he starts telling me how I was gonna fail. I wouldn't be able to compete if I went up there. He starts laying out all the differences in the schools. You haven't had this, you haven't had that, you haven't had, they're gonna be teaching foreign languages up there, you haven't had any foreign languages. They're gonna be teaching mathematics and trigonometry and algebra, you haven't even had algebra yet. And you, what makes you think you're gonna be able to compete if you go up there? So your principal tells me you wanna go off to college. You're not, gonna, you're not even gonna be able to graduate if you go up there. He's telling me all this stuff. Mm. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, what is this? I, I got angry. <laughs> and I said, I said to myself, no, I was already gonna, wasn't going to go. But now you to <laughs> make me mad. So I finally, he kept going on and on. And I finally said, I don't mean to interrupt you. You've been, I, you've been talking for almost 15 minutes. And I, so I think I can save us both a lot of time. I had, or I made up my mind that I wasn't going, but left to listen to you. Oh, yeah, I, I know I'm going, I'm going up there, and I'm going to graduate. He says, well, I don't think you're going to. I said, well, I, you, that's your opinion. I, I said, I know all those kids. I know all of them. I said, they're not any more intelligent than I am. As a matter of fact, let them a lot less intelligent than I am. I said, I don't know quite what I'm going to face when I get there. That may be a little bit difficult to me, but I know I can handle the academics. So I will go up there and I will graduate. And he said, oh, I see, then I think you, he said, looks like you've made up my mind. I said, well, I hadn't, but you, <laughs> you just forced me to change my mind. I mean, just look at it. When someone just studied, I, 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 he was just putting me down. The more he talked, the more I felt like he was just putting me down. Putting me down my entire race, me personally. I, I, you don't even know me. Right. But you're sitting there telling me I can't, I can't compete. So that that was the end of that. I went. Uh, it was uh, like I said. It was like a like a different world, uh, from being an all black school to to this integrated school. And I had a lot of problems initially. The early the, the first first day we were there, they had the police all there, and you know, all those problems. And the parents, we all some of the parents were there, even though they'd only gone through this once before. The Elmer Wolf, they were still there. Fritz got to the first week. Yeah. Uh, some of the teachers would give me a hard time. A lot of them, some of them were great. Mm -hmm. I remember this one math teacher, uh, Mr. Chilcoat. He said to me, he said, young man, you look like you, uh, you are really got, you understand mathematics. And he said, I see you by your record, you haven't had a lot of training in math. You haven't had anything in math. Uh, but he said, you've got the basic, you still understand a lot of this. So they gave me a test. Because I wanted to sign up, I wanted to take classes like trigonometry and all that. And they said, no, you, you don't have the prerequisites to take these classes. Well, I said, well, I'm here. I'm, 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 I'm. So we kept arguing, going back and forth. And I said, all right, we're going to give you a test. And if you can pass this algebra test, then we will let you take class. Well, I don't think they thought I was going to pass it. Mm -hmm. So they gave me this test. And I, I almost maxed the thing. <laughs> when, I didn't, when I didn't have a class in, in math, in algebra, I almost maxed the test. Mm -hmm. But they'd already told me they were let me in, so they couldn't backtrack now, so they had to let me, let me take these classes. It was, it was pretty miserable initially until the athletics started. Once the athletic program started, and I wound up as one of the top athletes there, well, very quickly, things started turning around as far as I was concerned. 
but there was still a lot of problems with a lot of other, a lot of the other children there. Man, I mean, one of the problems we had, remember I said we rode the bus from Union Bridge? I said to myself, I can, I can sleep in in the mornings now, finally. When I went up, when I went to Francis, I well, I didn't. They put us on the same bus. The same bus that we rode from Union Bridge to Westminster, they put us on the same bus to take us to Francis Scott Key. Well, we were there in five minutes, six, seven minutes, I guess it was, from our house to Francis Scott Key High School. So we got there about 6.15, 6.20 in the morning. The school wasn't even open. Mm. So there's 15 black students sitting there all by ourselves every morning for that entire year. We were there every morning before school even opened. What time did school open? At nine o'clock then. We were there at six, six fifteen, six twenty. You can't put fifteen students out there by themselves with no supervision. I got called in the principal's office and I was told you are gonna be responsible for all, all these students, all these black students here. You're you're a senior, you're you're old enough, you can control them. And wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I'm out there with them, but I, I, I'm not, you can't hold me responsible for these children. I mean, I'll do what I can, but I'm not going to take the responsibility for it. So invariably, there were some problems, and so a couple of students got suspended along with me, since I was supposed to be responsible for it. Uh, my, I went home, I know my father was going to be upset. Mm -hmm. He was, he was upset. <laughs> he told him I'd been suspended. And when I told him why, he said, oh, you can't, then it's a, he said, are you sure you're telling me the truth? And I said, yeah, I didn't do anything. I, they just held me responsible for all these kids. And he said, no, 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 no. That's, that's not going to work. So next day, he, we had the president of the Carroll County chapter at NAACP. Of course, his son was there, too. He's, my father, they took me back to school. <laughs> I don't know what, they didn't let me go in. I was sitting out there in the, in the lobby. But they're all three of them, they were in there for about an hour. <laughs> they came out, I was back in school. Well, when graduation came up, I was really surprised when I, when I heard who, who was going to be there. Of course, the superintendent of schools was going to be there. He said, he's going to be handing out diplomas, and he's going to be doing several things during the program. I said, ah, oh, huh, I'm going to see this <laughs> man. Um, so they never made, didn't, didn't tell us anything. We didn't know what, what was going to happen uh, until the night of graduation, and when I I got called up there three different times. Uh, once to get a diploma, when I wanted to get my diploma, he, he shook my hand. He said, I see you made it after all. And I said, well, there wasn't any doubt in my mind I was going to make it. You were the only one who, who, you didn't know what you were talking about anyway. <laughs> and I walked away from him. And when I came back the second time, uh, I got the top award for being an all-around student, first all-around student for academic achievement, sports, and all of them. Yeah. Got that award. And he, of course, he was there. He's the one who <laughs> gave me that award. And he said, "Now I see you did well in everything. You're getting, getting with the top award here. And I said, well, I, maybe you need to spend a little bit more time. Stop, stop judging people by, their, by the color of their skin. <laughs> you won't have this problem. You didn't know me from Adam. And he's, he's trying to get me away from him. I said, you didn't know me from Adam, but you, you made up your mind I couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. So he tried, I walked away from him. And then they announced the, the uh, scholarships. And of course, I got one of all the scholarships. Uh -huh. And I went back up there, and he gave me all my scholarships. And he said, yeah, I guess you're right. I guess I don't know what I'm talking about. And I said, I have no doubt about that. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I, I really did. I was pleasantly surprised that even though we didn't have a lot of the materials and a lot of the facilities and a lot of the stuff they had at this school, those teachers taught us well. Mm -hmm. They couldn't teach us a lot of the material that they had at the school, but what they did teach, they did an excellent job of teaching. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of the basics. I was well grounded in the basics. Mm -hmm. So it was very easy to pick up the rest of the stuff. And of course, my office is right off the dining room in the, v in the VFW. And there was always a bunch of ladies sitting there, elder ladies. I didn't know who they were. I mean, they were coming to eat lunch or something. And I'd come out of my office. I had to walk right past them every day. So I came out of there one day, and, it's, and it was, there was about five of them sitting there. And this one lady says, stops me, and she says, I have, I, I don't know whether you know this young man or not, but you probably do. She said, I've been trying to find a young man 
graduated from Francis Scott Key High School. His name is Hollingsworth. Uh, and she said, I've been looking for him for some time. Well, <laughs> I'm standing there talking to her. And she said, do you, know, you, happen, you happen to know him, Mr. Hollingsworth? And I said, yeah, I know him very well. That's me. And she said, you graduated from Francis Scott Key? I said, yes, I did graduate. You were in the first class that graduated from Francis Scott Key High School. I said, yes, I was. She said, your name is Hollingsworth? And I said, yes, I am. That's me. And she said to me, I owe you a tremendous apology. Well, and by this time, I'm, I've been in graduate from college. I've been in the military. I did 20 years in the military. I, back home, that's about 35 years later. I'd forgotten about, I mean, I'd forgotten it, but, you know, kind of put it in the back of your mind. And I said, well, you owe me an apology. What do you owe me an apology for? And she said, uh, I was there when you kids came in there when you first started school. And I was one of them who threw tomatoes at you. And she said, I've always regretted that, that I did that. Uh, and I said to myself that I was going to find you one of these days. I didn't realize you were, that you were the man at the time. Uh, but I've been asking everybody I saw, particularly some of the blacks, every time I'd see them, I'd ask them if they knew who you were. And somebody told me that you were out here at the VFW. Um, so I, she said, so she gave, she gave me a big hug. And she said, I, I am sincerely apologize. I'm so sorry for my actions back then. <laughs> And I said, well, I appreciate that very much, but mm -hmm. uh, that was years ago, and I've forgotten most of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I tried not to remember the negative stuff. Mm -hmm. No matter where you come from, you can be something if you work hard at it. You know, it's not where you come from, it's, it's where you're going. One of the expressions I've heard Dr. Crawford use often and, and, and it's good for a small school like us. So it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. And, and, and that's the reason uh, most of, athletic, athletically, most of the schools that we competed against were larger than we were. But we didn't back down because they were larger than we were. I have two grandchildren who are coming along a granddaughter who's 17, and a grandson who's 12. And we talk quite a bit about how things were when, when I was in school. And I don't know why they just skip their mother. They just do. <laughs> mm -hmm. But they, they love the stories to hear the stories of how things were mm -hmm. when we were in school. Well, Grandmom, you know, things aren't like that anymore. That's why I'm telling you this, because I want you to make things better in your time. It, it's, it's part of history, I think, and it's not something that they are used to getting. They're not going to get that in a book. Their stories should awaken in all of us the importance of Sankofa. Sankofa comes from the Akon people of West Africa. Sankofa teaches us that we must go back to our roots in order to move forward. That is, we should reach back and gather the best of what our past has to teach us so that we can achieve our full potential as we move forward. Whatever we've lost, forgotten, or been stripped of can be reclaimed, revived, preserved, and perpetuated. Mm -hmm.